ready for the word? Come on, put that in the chats. Are you ready for a word from God? I really believe God has a word for us. So God bless your word, bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so happy to be sharing with you today. We've been talking about rise of the prophets. Hasn't it been wonderful? Hasn't it been impactful? And how many people are feeling that prophetic rise in your heart? That the Holy Spirit is moving on you to speak to powers and to do things that you've never done before by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, I just want to start today uh, with a statement. The statement is, in the early 80s, a group of hip-hop evangelists named Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five wrote a prophetic declaration that stated, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha. It's like a jungle sometimes it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Whoo, those are prophetic words. Thank you, evangelist. In the last month, I've been hearing that the common feeling among black folk have been exhaustion. Can I get an amen? Does anyone else feel like that out in the audience? Exhaustion. I mean, we had hoped that we were a little further than this, right? We had hoped we, would, we had came a little, little further than this. Our brother Langston Hughes puts it this way. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust over like syrupy sweet? Maybe it's just sags like a heavy lead or does it explode? What, what do we do when we're just exhausted and all our hopes seem to dry up like a raisin in the sun? Proverbs puts it like this. Proverbs um, 13 and 12 says, hope defers makes the heart sick. Hope defers make the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is like a tree of life. And I'm feeling like there's a lot of heart sickness going on right now. I'm feeling like there is a lot of people who have the same sickness in the land, and it's called hope fatigue. Have you been feeling the symptoms of hope fatigue? Have you gotten to the point where you just can't see it no more? I don't want to see another video. I don't want to hear another instance. I don't want to tell nobody else or to explain to them about racism. I'm tired. Can you put a hand emoji up in the comments? Can you just say something in the comments if that is you? Some of us need a second win, an upgrade, an upgrade of hope. Is that you? Are you at the point, are you like in a marathon and you feel like your legs can't go no more and you just need some water? How many people just need a timeout in the spirit and you just need a little more hope, another dose of hope? Is that you? Can you please put that's me in the chat? Well, our passage from the lectionary reading today is going to help us out today. I want to talk to you about the rise of prophetic hope. The rise of prophetic hope. Can someone put that in the chat? The rise of prophetic hope. We've been having rise of the prophets, but I feel like God is talking to us and wants to say that there is a rising of prophetic hope, and it's a hope that says everything's going to be all right, even when it don't look right. Everything's going to be all right, even when it don't look like. I'm talking about Holy Ghost hope. Now, notice I didn't say Holy Spirit. I'm going all the way in. Holy Ghost hope. I want to convince you on today that our social justice efforts have to be fueled by the Holy Spirit. They have to be fueled by the Holy Spirit. Everything we do in social justice has to be fueled by the Holy Ghost. 
Otherwise, you will collapse under the weight of it, your spirit, your mind, your spiritual mind, everything. You will collapse under the pressure in your own strength. So we come to Romans 8. And in this passage, Paul writes to a church in Rome, a house church in Rome. And it was a mixed group of Jewish and Gentile believers who were learning how to worship together. They were struggling to get along. And they were starting to feel the very beginnings of persecution under the evil rule of Nero. Romans 5, 8. It reads like this. Romans, I'm sorry, Romans 5, 1 through 8. I'm starting at verse 1. It says, Therefore... Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, this is where we're going to park at today. Not only that. But we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because the love, God's love, has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We're going to park today in verse 3 and 4. And we're going to find that there is a divine formula for prophetic hope. God has given us a divine formula for prophetic hope. It's a process. So we're going to do this. We're going to make like a gospel gumbo today. Are y'all good with that? How many people like gumbo out there? Anybody like gumbo? Let me see. Yeah, yeah. You like gumbo? I love me a good part of gumbo. Today, we're going to make like a gospel gumbo. We're going to talk about the ingredients for hope. Is that all right? All right. So we're going to go back to verse 3 and 4. And it says, the first recipe, the first ingredient we need to make this gospel gumbo is that we rejoice in suffering. It's the first ingredient. And this is surprising. Rejoice in suffering. That's, most people were like, well, that's where I tap out of the gumbo. No, but I want you to hold on for a second because it's surprising because he got, it doesn't say here to be in your feelings in suffering. It doesn't say to soak in your sufferings. It doesn't even say be angry in your suffering. It says rejoice with a, with a question mark. I would have put a question mark there. But this is another kingdom opposite that we see in the Bible. You know, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The greatest, whoever wants to be the greatest, got to be a servant. The one who, if someone slaps you, you're supposed to what? Turn the other cheek. If someone wants you to go one mile, you're supposed to go two. If someone takes your coat, you're supposed to give them your two. All these kingdom opposites that you know we know all that. We like, wait, hold up. You know, because all of these things, these kings, and then he has the nerve to say, rejoice in suffering. It's a kingdom opposite. And it's something that we cannot do in our flesh. You got to get this. It's impossible for us to do this in our nature because you run up on the wrong day. It might not turn out as a kingdom opposite. But these are things you can't do in your flesh. But if you can rejoice through suffering, you, my friend, are a candidate for hope. How many want to be a candidate for hope? You see... When we start our gospel gumbo, when we get in this ingredient, the first ingredients we have, we have to know that suffering produces. Suffering develops. It's kind of like think of suffering as the roux of your, of your gumbo. Anybody know about that roux? You got to start with that base of your gumbo. Now, there ain't no gumbo unless you get that roux right. You got to be right. It can't be too light now. You got to have you some, some, some people be having a light skin roux. You got to have you a dark skinned roux. You got to make it look right now. So a lot of times, think of suffering as this roux. You can't even start. You can't even start this process without knowing that suffering produces. Now, hope doesn't always start with good news, my friend. 
Sometimes hope starts with suffering. And this is a part of the human experience. It's a part of the black experience. It's a part of the Christian experience. And we don't take a lot of time to park in this, in this theology of suffering. We want to skip over it. We want our cars. We want our houses. We want our comfortability. But a lot of times we got to sit right here and park in this suffering, just like Paul said in Philippians 3.10, 3, Philippians 3, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering to be conformed to his death. See, we don't want to stop right here and make the rule to our gumbo. A lot of times suffering is like the bay leaf that you put in there. You won't necessarily eat that bay leaf. You won't even have a whole bowl of bay leaf, but you need it to go into your gumbo. Amen. Shout out to, past, uh, to Sister Rochelle, who is our resident gumbo maker at the Way Christian Center. Can't nobody do it better than you, Sister Rochelle. We love you. So now... Suffering is a part of this human experience, and we have suffered as black people in this country. We have, come, we have suffered, and we continue to suffer because of others' perception of our skin color. Our skin color, my brothers and sisters, is not the problem. It's others' perception of our skin color. Thank you, Minister LeVon, for that rev revelation. Our skin color is not the, the problem. It's other people's perception. But I have good news for us who are experiencing suffering. God is always on the side of the persecuted. God is always on the side of the suffering. God is always on the side of the marginalized. If you ever want to know where Jesus is, go to the people who are suffering. It's the oxymoron that something beautiful comes from suffering. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. So we go through suffering. So that's our base. We're starting with suffering. And it says, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces something. It produces something in our life. The first thing that it produces is endurance. Someone say endurance. Someone write endurance in the chat. Suffering produces endurance. And this is the quality that our ancestors had. This is the quality that our ancestors possess, po, po, had in their hearts. For 400 years, they endured terror at the hands of white America. The original terrorist stepped foot on this country in 1619. They have um, lived through black clothes and, and slave codes and KKK terrorism, Jim Crow laws, segregation, lynching. And once we finally had our communities and had our banks and had our businesses and had our whole communities, then we would experience Rosewood and Tulsa we have endured, our ancestors have endured suffering. And then they were even given a false gospel, a false gospel that told them that Jesus and God was okay with them being treated in this manner, that it was okay for them to be slaves, that it was okay for them to be in chains, that it was okay for them to be mistreated and to be whipped, and they must submit. This was a false gospel, brothers and sisters. They were even given slave Bibles that took out the whole book of Exodus and any scripture that dealt with freedom. Scriptures like, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. They didn't want us to know Jesus as a liberator. We were given a false gospel, and a lot of people thought, like, why are black people still following Christianity? Well, I'd like to present to you that they weren't even given the real Christianity. They were presented a false gospel. But brothers and sisters, our ancestors had an encounter and met the real Jesus. They met the real Jesus. Our ancestors didn't even uh, believe these things. They met a Jesus. They had an encounter with God on their own. And you know what? The slave owners weren't counting on that because they didn't even know Jesus for themselves. 
Jesus. I, you know what? You know how I know that our ancestors met the real Jesus? Because there's no other way they could have endured those 400 years. That real Jesus gave them a prophetic hope that can only come from endurance. They sung songs about heaven. They sung songs about freedom. And they prayed for a better life for their children. So I want you to look at your hands and look at your feet and know that you are an answer to your ancestors' prayers. God met them. The real Jesus met them. So when I understand that we say we are tired and that we're exhausted, but they took all the heavy lifting for us. Our ancestors took all the heavy lifting for us, and we must always honor them, and we must always remember them. It is very important that we honor our ancestors. Just like in the Old Testament, God always had the children of Israel to leave memorials everywhere, everywhere. Remember this time, and remember what happened here. And every time God would address God's self, he would say, I am the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. He would always list ancestors to say who he was. So God is always wanting us to remember our ancestors and honor them. Hallelujah. So do, did you think, do you think, do you think our ancestors knew that when you rejoice in suffering that it produced endurance? I mean, our, 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 our ancestors weren't even allowed to read. They, most of them couldn't even read the Bible. Do you think they knew this? Do you think they knew that when you rejoice, it produces endurance? Because this is my question. How can a people so oppressed be so creative and expressive? You know, by all accounts, we should be the most miserable people on the face of the earth. We should be sad and downtrodden with no joy and no hope. We created our own culture from nothing. That what I, that's what I call prophetic hope. Prophetic hope gives a joy that's revolutionary. Just like this teacher says, black joy is revolutionary. Can you put that in the chat? Black joy is revolutionary. How could this be? How could we have done this? It had, they had to have known something. They had to have encountered the real Jesus. Could this be? I'm just going to throw this out. Could this be why we are so persecuted as a people? Come on, think about it with me. The devil hates our joy. The devil hates our praise. The devil hates our worship. We, we, the, the devil can't do anything with that. I think that people, they look at us and say, how can it happen? Have you ever been to a black church? They can't understand our worship. Our worship and our praise is so vibrant and it's so expressive, but yet we are the most oppressed people. How can this be? Our prayers, our songs, we are living our ancestors' wildest dreams, my friend. This is why we can't get tired. This is why we can't give up. This is why we can't throw in the towel, because they did the heavy lifting for us. It's our time to take the baton and keep running, because they did it. The devil hates our joy. The devil hates our praise. I read something that says, hey, y'all, we are the new ancestors, so act accordingly. It's our time. It's our time to step up. So now we're, we're still making this, this gumbo. We got our roux. Now it's time to throw in, you know, some sausage, some chicken, some shrimp. What else y'all put in there? Some crab. Y'all, you know, you got to mix all that in. How many of y'all put okra in your gumbo? I want to, mm, okay, okay, yep, yep, I don't know about okra. I heard, I heard an amen in here. I'll do, I'll do an okra. It's all good. So now it's time for our ingredients. So rejoicing in suffering produces endurance, and then endurance produces character. One of the translations I read said it produces a strength in character. 
think about your character. Have you gotten out of character in the chats lately? Have you gotten out of character in the comment sections? Have you have been explaining to people why racism exists in America? Have you gotten out of character as you've explained to people why Black Lives Matter? Have you been, you know, having Facebook fights and Instagram knockdown drag outs in the comments, trying to explain something to someone who really doesn't want to understand? Strength in character helps you to realize that racism is demonic. Can you put that in the chats? Racism is demonic. Racism is demonic. Say it with me. Racism is demonic. I want to uh, read a quote from one of my little spiritual nieces, Tyler Brewington, who is a member of The Way, and she lives in L.A. now. But she wrote a post that was so spot on. It was a rhema word. I had, to, I had to call her and be like, girl, that was a rhema word. And if they could pull that up on the screen, Tyler says, hear me when I say this, because I do not say it lightly. Racism is demonic. That is what an exorcism is. It is a revealing of an evil spirit. Demons do not go down quietly without a fight. When demons are revealed, they flail and scream and become violent. And when confronted with the truth, they, I'm sorry, when confronted with the truth. What we are seeing right now in America is, is exercising itself of demons that has been here for centuries. This is not to hyper-spiritualize what is going on, but to be mindful that the pain, violence, and tensions that are happening are deeper than what we can physically see. It will not be pretty, but it will be worth it to be free of racism and all the other is isms in the end. The future depends on the work that every person puts in now to heal both their inner demons as well as our societal demons. Can y'all put some clap emojis for this own time rhema word from Sister Tyler because she was right on it. Racism is demonic. You know, we shouldn't be surprised that when racism keeps popping up, you know, when we keep seeing these videos and we keep, sometimes it really takes us aback because most of us say, it's 2020. I thought we were over this. I thought we were past this. But can I tell you, the same demon that landed on the shores in 1619 is the same demon that keeps popping up right now in 2020s, that demons have the same mode of operation. And if all it needs is a host or a person who is willing to let them manifest in them. So we're seeing the same spirit. The demons don't have any other mode of operation but to operate in the same same way with that they originally did when they first got here. So we can't lie. I love what Pastor Donna said on Friday. If you're looking at the, um, the devotionals, that doesn't take away a person's uh, right to choose. A person still has autonomy. They still have a choice to, uh, to, let, um, to operate in these manners. We're still holding the person accountable, but we have to get to a point where we can look at someone and look past them and look right at the heart of the matter that this is a demon that is manifesting itself. How else will you explain that a man would keep his knee down on someone's neck for almost nine minutes unless you are full of demons, unless you are full of the devil. Demons are real. Racism is real because de racism is demonic. Now, I'm going to tell you why racism is so dangerous, because racism is an insult to the image of God. It's an insult. It's like trying to slap God in the face. It's trying to say that God, what you created is not, is not good. What you created, whatever you made in your image, we don't want it. I don't want it just like, and I love this, this uh, slide that someone sent me of our brothers and sisters out there. They said, Christ and racism do not mix. You can't be in love with God and hate his creation. 
Shout out to all our allies out there. Shout out to our white brothers and sisters who are joining us in the struggle. struggle. Shout out to all our non-black families and friends who are standing with us in this moment. We feel you, we see you, we love you. Thank you for your support. Because this is a new, this is an insult. Whenever someone operates in a demonic spirit of racism, they're insulting God's image. And this is why we need Holy Ghost, Spirit-Fueled Social Justice. Say it with me. Holy Ghost, Spirit-Fueled Social Justice. Look at Mark 16. If you are a believer, you signed up for a believer's package. You have things that are available to you as a believer. And Mark 16, 17 tells us one of it. It says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. Do you believe? Raise your hand, put a hand emoji if you believe. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in that he's the son of God? Well, guess what? You have, you have a package set up just for you. These signs shall follow, shall accompany those who believe. In my name, they will what? Cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Brothers and sisters, we have a power available to us that when we run into the spirit of of racism, when we run into this demonic force, that we are able as believers in Christ to cast it out in Jesus' name, to say, you got to go, devil, in Jesus' name, to say that we are made in the image of God and that we will not be subjected to any of this anymore because we believe in the power in the name of God. It also believes that we, that we will speak in new tongues. There's a power in the Holy Spirit that's available to you. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God wants to use you to, to raise you up for prophetic hope, to cast out these demons out of our cities, out of the police departments, out of our government? We have the power to do it in the name of Jesus, but we can't do it in our own strength. It has to be Holy Ghost. Spirit-fueled social justice. Can I get an amen? Um, there was a story in, in, in Matthew 17. You could turn to it on your own time. When the disciples, the man brought his son who had demons, and he brought it to Jesus. He's like, hey, guys, can y'all help me? Can you cast out this out of my son? And the disciples couldn't do it. And then the man came to Jesus and said, hey, I took him to your disciples. They couldn't do it. And Jesus was like, oh, yeah, and be cast out. And Jesus, just be gone. And it happened in an instance. The disciples came all, you know, they was all, you know, broken in, in their spirit, all butthurt. And it was like, hey, how come we couldn't do that? Remember that story in Matthew 17? And he said, hey, Jesus said, let me tell you, this kind, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. There are some kind that will not go out except by prayer and fasting. This is why we are on our 21-day consecration. We are taking a stand in the spirit. We are saying that we are confronting these demonic powers and these demonic forces of racism. We are saying in the name of Jesus, be cast out of our society, out of our police departments, out of our government. But this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So there are some spiritual disciplines that we need to dive into to see and have an impact in our country. Also, strength of character helps us to see who we're really fighting against. Because a lot of us are in these chats and we're looking at people crazy and the co-work, we're looking at our co-workers side-eyeing them. But you know, there's something else as a believer we have to look deeper Ephesians 6, 11 and 12 tells us we have to put on the whole armor of God. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places, my friend. You're not fighting people. 
We're fighting the spirit behind people. We're still holding people accountable. But we're going to cast out these spirits in Jesus' name. The last thing, I think we're ready. Our, I think our gumbo is just about ready. We're about to eat this gumbo. We're about to have this formula for hope. And the result is, once you finish it, we have a result. Once you've uh, rejoiced in suffering and you've endured and you have character, it just says character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame. Another translation says, hope doesn't disappoint. Can you put that in the chats? Hope doesn't disappoint. And I know what it's like to be disappointed in this country. So many times we thought we had a win, but ended up disappointed. A lot of us wonder, when will we get a real win in this country without some type of backlash coming with it? You know, the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, we thought we were free. Turns out it was just a, another cruel trick because they had no intention of setting us free or setting us up for success. We were promised 40 acres and the mule. I'm still waiting on my land and my whip. I'm, I'm, re I'm ready to drive something. But that turned out to even be a disappointment. Juneteenth that we're about to celebrate by ourselves without a presidential ele a can campaign happening. Thank you. Juneteenth in 1865, when the news finally got two years later, got all the way to Texas, they thought, we, we did it. This is it. We're forever free. But once again, disappointment because it only led to sharecropping because they set us up because they didn't let us have a way to sustain ourselves as people. Then we thought, okay, we'll be just separate. We're okay being separate, but can it be equal? Can we be separate but equal? But once again, we had the poorest quality of everything. And then finally, President Barack Obama came along and we said, this is it. We, oh, we finally, I mean, crying when he got elected. I mean, out the tears. But then, once again, our, 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 our President Obama even ran on a campaign of hope. But once he got in office, we didn't really see everything we wanted to see, what we imagined we can see in, in the, the Senate and the Congress, filibustered him and all these things, all these reasons why we didn't really get the win that we thought that we would. We even thought we were free from lynchings, and we thought we were done with that era, and we thought that that was a thing of a past, but now we're seeing modern-day lynchings right on our phones. We're still seeing modern-day lynchings. When will we get a win? We've been so used to disappointment in this country, but, oh, my friends, there is a hope that does not disappoint. And this is a hope that you can only get from the Holy Ghost. This is a hope that you can only get from the Holy Ghost because it's a prophetic hope. Come on, it's a prophetic hope. It's a hope that says everything's going to be all right, even though it doesn't look all right. It says, I know my Redeemer lives. It says, trouble don't last all long way. How many people have this prophetic hope? How many know that this is the result of everything we endure is a prophetic hope? So here is the takeaway. The takeaways is that we need the Holy Ghost poured out. Come on, somebody say that in the chat. We need the Holy Ghost poured out. Hold on on that slide real quick. We don't, we need the power of the Holy Ghost poured out. The end of that verse in Romans says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Listen to me. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. When you know who you are, and you know whose you are, you become untouchable. 
I'll say it again. When you know who you are and you know whose you are, you become untouchable. For 400 years, the majority group of this country has tried to convince us that we are less than. They have tried to tell us we're not smart, we're not capable, we're not able, we're not intelligent, we can't do it, we can't police ourselves, we can't do anything. They've made us feel that we are less than, but oh, my brothers and sisters, when you know the love of God, when the love of God has been poured out in your heart and you know who God is, it changes everything. The Holy Spirit will tell you who you are in God. And black, black people, we need to know who we are in God's eyes, that we are loved, that we are blessed, that we are free, that we are royalty, that we are beautiful, that we have been chosen and gifted and valuable, that we have purpose, that we are strong and beloved, that we are intelligent because we have the mind of Christ, that we are co-heirs with Jesus, that we can be bold because we are God's masterpiece. We are God's children, and we are made in God's image. When you know who you are and when you know whose you are, you become untouchable. I don't need anybody to validate my imago Dei. I don't need anyone to tell me I am valuable. It took 400 years for them to start acknowledging that our lives matter. If I, I don't care. I don't care if you like me. I don't even care if you don't approve that my life matters. All I know is that I know who God is and I know that God loves me. So practical takeaways, saints, we got to take a mental break from the chats. You got to realize that everybody's not going to be excited about black lives. And everybody's not excited that black lives matter. We got to refocus. We can't, we got to focus on the issue at hand. We can't get splintered off into all the ways that we're trying to explain our existence. We got to stop trying to get these people to like us. We got to stop striving for white approval. The only people who can't be racist right now are cops. The only people who can't be racist right now in this moment are police officers, our law enforcement officers, our police chiefs. So we're focusing on what really matters in this moment. So this is our last slide. These are our takeaways. This is what we want to pray for. We want to ask that the Holy Spirit be poured out. If you don't get anything else from this sermon, I want you to take some time and ask the Holy Spirit, to ask the Holy Ghost, pour out the love of God in my heart. We also want to ask for spiritual eyes to see what suffering can produce in your life. We don't like suffering. We run from suffering. We run from pain. But there's some things you learn in suffering that you'll never learn on a mountaintop. There's some things you learn in the valley that you'll never learn when you're up top and winning. So what are you doing in this moment? How are you stewarding this moment? How are we stewarding this moment as brothers and sisters? Also, we want to ask for a revolutionary joy. A revolutionary joy. The old, the old songs that our ancestors sang, they said, this joy I have. The world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. That's revolutionary joy. That's joy in the face of the enemy. That's joy when they oppress you and they look down on you that you still are able to lift your hands and praise God. You're still able to give God a praise because you know who God is to you. You know it's only God who could bring you through to help you through these times and give you the endurance and give you the strength and give you the character to make it. Our joy is revolution. Don't let the devil steal your joy. Don't let this world steal your joy. Our people come from a joy that cannot be explained. So live in that revolutionary joy. And this is the last thing. A lot of times we would just be like, God, 
pour out your spirit on me. I want prophetic hope. But this is different. You have to ask yourself, are you willing to go through the process to obtain prophetic hope? See, hope, prophetic hope is not something you just wake up with and it's like, oh, I feel hopeful today. Because that, that'll come and go, because tomorrow you're going to feel a different way. But when you have a prophetic hope, you hold on to that because you went through something to get that. You have an experience, and you have a history with God that nobody can take away. You went, for some, you went through something, and it means something to you. So I have a prophetic hope that I won't let go of. I have a prophetic hope that I can speak the heart of God, that I can know the heart of God for myself. I can know know that God sees more than I can see, and I'm going to trust God, and that that's a prophetic hope. I don't see it right now, but I trust the God that does. Amen? This is an eye on the prize type of hope, and I guarantee you, listen to me, saints, I can guarantee you that this world will let us down again. I can guarantee you, we've already seen more police shootings and more videos in broad daylight or on camera, that's the thing that makes us want to give up. I can guarantee you that there's more things that we're going to see, more disappointments that we're, we're going to be able, that we're going to have to experience. But this is why we need a prophetic hope. We need a hope that doesn't come from ourselves because we'll burn out. We can only do so much in our humanness. But when you reach into that prophetic hope, I feel a prophetic hope rising in our souls. I feel a prophetic hope rising in the inside. And I feel that God is lighting a fire within us that will make us not keep our eyes on the things that we can see. But we will keep our eyes on our God who knows all, who sees all, and is in control. Lastly, you can't have this hope without knowing Jesus. You can't have this hope without knowing Jesus. If you are listening on this uh, online program and you're saying, I need this hope. I need this hope that lasts. I need this hope that won't disappoint. I need this hope that will never go away. You can't get it unless you know Jesus. So this is a great day to make a decision for Jesus. And all you have to do is say, God, I want you in my life. Jesus, I believe in you, and I want to follow you. God, I want to experience this hope and this joy that you have that's available to each one that believes in you. And if you believe that, then you can have this hope. You can have access to it. We're just going to close in an in a old song that the old, the old folks used to sing. And it says, this joy I have, the world, nope, that's not the one. We're going to sing, I got a feeling. There it is. <laughs> Everything's going to be all right. Brother Mike going to help me with this. I got a feeling. This is what prophetic hope is about. Come on, y'all. I got a feeling. Yes. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, I Come on, sing that with me if you got prophetic hope. Everything's gonna be all right. Oh, come on, let me hear you sing it. Everything's gonna be all right. Hold on, is a Give the Lord a hand clap.
up if you believe that God is raising up prophetic hope in you to know that everything is going to be all right. Praise God.